Lauren, what are we going to talk about? I think it should be like a very, um, are we start, we're streaming right now, right? <laughs> Sorry. I think we are. We, this, this is how we do things now. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I was waiting for somebody else to intro. Um, I'm going to do that. Hi. <laughs> thanks for watching on whatever device you're watching from. Hopefully you're all safe and staying inside. Um, I heard a ton of response from folks out there uh, that want to know more about musical theater writing, um, how you begin, how you collaborate, how, what is the balance of song and um, dialogue and all the things. Um, and so the first, uh, I immediately thought of the people that you are seeing today, Kate Kerrigan and Brian Loudermill. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Um, Thank you. Kate and Brian and I have worked on a couple of projects together, musicals together, and they are the greatest, the smartest, encyclopedic knowledge of every musical ever. <laughs> and um, they're just so smart and such great collaborators. And it felt like the right um, group uh, to get together to talk about how you make a musical, how you make a song. I think people would love to know y'all how you two work together. Kate and Brian have a long history of writing way before me. <laughs> um, incredible musicals uh, like The Mad Ones, they're working on one, like a Henry V one I want you guys to talk about. Um, and yeah, and just tell us how you work together. Kate's also an amazing playwright and book writer herself. So I think she can tell us about that. So I think let's just dive in. Do you wanna tell us a little bit about the like training that y'all have in terms of where you come from, what you've studied in school, how you realized, oh my God, I'm a composer and I'm a book, I'm a lyric writer, play, uh, playwright, book writer. Um, how did you come to that? Brian, you wanna start? Sure. Um, I started a little earlier than Kate because I just loved musicals, very young. Um, I was in like fourth grade and I played like Michael in Peter Pan and I was flying around and that felt really cool. Um, I was playing Seymour across from uh, Kate's Audrey when we were in middle school, singing all of Cut Kate's high notes which was possibly a harbinger of what was to come. And uh, yeah, I just loved musicals. I think looking back, I loved how emotionally present you could be. I think I loved um, how vulnerable you could effortlessly be. And also part of it was there was just something in the water where Kate and I were growing up and um, there were some really talented singers around. I was not one of them. So I sort of was trying to give myself a, an excuse to get to be in the room with these incredibly talented people. <laughs> and by process of elimination, <laughs> I found myself drifting over to the piano. <laughs> Great, and you studied, what did you study in various schools? Oh, I was really bad at learning things when people wanted me to. <laughs> I respect that. So if you're right now maybe learning some things on your own, take heart. Um, I went to Harvard for ostensibly math and left after one semester. Then I went to Berkeley School of Music and I was not doing the right kinds of drugs to make any friends there. And so I left Berkeley and then I went to NYU where I mostly just started like skipping classes and immediately interning on Broadway for free when I was like 19, 20. And by the, time, um, by the time Kate, I was like 21, Kate and I had our first commission for our first show. Um, yeah. That's not and, a bad uh, role. I love it. I love it. I Kate, tell us about, about you. Along. Yeah. So, Brian's kind of like underplaying a couple things about Brian. Like, yes, Brian gravitated over to the piano, but like, you don't just gravitate over to the piano if you're like a normal human being in the way that Brian gravitated over to the piano. Like, Brian discovered the circle of fifths without ever knowing what it was. Like, just so there's this. There is like a little bit of um, uh, wonderkin to Brian's discovery of the piano and uh, and suddenly being able to like jump in and uh, and uh, change keys on command and 
and caused a lot of problems and a lot of classes for um, for a bunch of like 10 year olds who like suddenly were singing five steps above what they were supposed to be singing because Brian got bored. Um, so it's like <laughs> funny. There's a lot of funny stories within all of that. Um, I, I grew up, um, my dad lived in the area where Brian's family lives and, um, and still does. And they both were doing theater in the same place in the Swarthmore, um, Delaware County area outside of Philadelphia. And I spent one summer, I knew Brian growing up, um, but we didn't really get to know each other until there was a summer that I spent in Philadelphia with my living with my dad and uh, I did all of the summer theater camps which we didn't have in northeastern Pennsylvania where I normally lived um so that was like I mean I feel like I I bit the, the theater bug bit me really hard um in that community because the community was pretty amazing um when I wasn't doing that I was playing the violin um for from the time I was four until the time I was 18 and that ended up being like a surprising um helpful thing that I could never have imagined being connected to theater. Um, but that turns out music, uh, the way that uh, you play the violin and the way you bow, it's actually very similar to the way you breathe. And uh, it meant that when Brian decided to teach me how to write lyrics, the idea of phrasing and the idea of the way that a, so a lyric fits onto music um, came to me sort of naturally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I went through the, um, when Brian and I started writing together, I was writing plays in college and um, Brian was, Brian came to me and we reconnected. We were both in New York City. I was a partner and Brian said, do you want to write a musical? And in the way that like when you're 20, 21 years old, someone sends you an email and says, do you want to write a musical? And you say, yeah, sure. Of course. Why, why wouldn't I do that? I don't, I don't know. Why would you write a musical? And so our first musical was like my exploration about why someone would sing instead of speak. Um, and it was like a very heady little piece, but it's really cool. And there's, there's like one, there was one theater critic who like thought it was the best thing ever. And like, talk, talk to me about it like a couple days ago again. Um, so it's like, this is a little cult, um, piece called, uh, the woman upstairs. And, uh, I wrote the book for it and I did not really write too many lyrics for it, but Brian just kept pushing me to learn how to write lyrics and had this sense that I had the right tools. I had been studying poetry, I had been studying um, fiction writing and I had this music background. And so, and Brian really encouraged me and I ended up going to BMI um, where Brian also went, but I, I'm, I'm a very good student. So I brought Brian back with me and he promised that Brian would not go on her phone and, <laughs> and I promised that she would not fall asleep. And we like finished off BMI together, um, which is an incredible program in that it is, um, it's, it's very rule oriented, which isn't necessarily Brian's favorite place to be. But for me, it was really great because I felt like I got um, all the basics, like all the very simple song structures. And, and they were really cool about how it, like, if you really broke the rule well, they let you go. And if you didn't, they really, really laid into you. And so I, I learned how to break more rules really well if I was gonna do it. Um, and we weren't, we weren't perfect students there. They didn't love us, but it was, it's a free program and it's a very, very useful program. And you learn a ton about collaboration in it. Um, and it's- I think and, that's and so key. Go there for free is unbelievable. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's great. So yeah. cut up, y'all. I mean, and part of what we're really doing here today is talking about collaboration, how you collaborate, how you listen to somebody. I have never learned that quicker than writing musicals. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I will say the, the like two or three things that I know for sure about musicals. One was taught to me by John Rando at a very early project that I worked on with him that he was directing. Um, Harry Connick Jr. did the music too, and the lyrics to this, this I remember play. that time of your life. Right, you remember that. This little Christmas play, it's called The Happy Elf. It is adorable. They needed a rewrite of the book and brought me in, and I had never done a musical before. Um, I was kind of like, blink, blink, <laughs> um, what? And, uh, and John Randall was like, your job is to get to the songs. <laughs> your job yeah. is book writer, earn those songs, get to them, transition organically out <laughs> this is what yeah. you do 
So learning that very clearly was like, oh, I see yeah. how much storytelling goes on in the songs. And I think that's important for those writers out there, which both of you can speak to, how much story and action and character is in the songs. It's not a stop and let's sing about love. That's of course not how musicals go. There are decisions actively being made, discoveries being made within the song. So that is certainly different than say pop writing, which has a journey to it certainly. Um, but I would love for y'all to speak about that. And then maybe we can talk about how do you start a musical? If you're like, I would love to write one. I have an idea. How do you begin So maybe first start talking about like what what is a musical? <laughs> like, why do we do it this way? Why, what does a song do in a musical? All that. One of the things that I think is really, has been really interesting about my collaborations with Lauren, who I think I've worked on like four pieces, depending on how you're counting with, um, is, okay, so Lauren just alluded to a difference between musical theater songwriting and musical theater pop and um, pop writing. Um, the, the main element of any pop song is repetition. It's, it hardly matters what that first idea is. It can be, we're stuck at home. And like the most important thing is, okay, so then we say something else and then we repeat, we're stuck at home. And like the, the most important thing is that you're coming back to the same ideas recursively. There was a mathy part of my brain that always really appreciated that, that it's just layers of repetition inside of other layers of repetition. Um, and especially today, listening to pop music, everything is designed to repeat. Even like a verse is supposed to be catchy enough that you hear it again later. A good play is not recursive. And that's what's extraordinary about Lauren's work is it's like, we're gonna start here, we're gonna end somewhere all the way there and you will not believe how we're gonna get from point A to point B. <laughs> and I will never, um, I will never bore you by telling you the same thing again and again. And I will always look for these exciting shortcuts to, to jump you along in the story. Um, trying to find a healthy relationship between those two desires is the entire trick of musical theater songwriting. Um, book writing, yes, it's <laughs> this other kind of math, but I can say from a songwriting perspective, it's saying um, for Kate, Kate can talk to you about second verses. Tell you what, the goal is how much farther can I take you towards this emotional idea with choruses? How much can I repeat about like an ongoing emotional journey while allowing that to always be evolving so that the same idea, we're stuck at home. The first verse is maybe about a grocery store. The second verse is about your relationship with your sister. And by the end, the last verse, the last chorus, we're singing about we're stuck at home and what does that mean emotionally for us as a society? There's this like growing based on emotional ideas that stay, um, that stay recurrent. The thing, that, <clears throat> the thing that I think is interesting about plays and musicals that is I actually think the same is that there's, um, there's, that, there's this like old adage that a music that a, that a that a song or I, I guess it's about scenes too there's this old adage that a scene has to be about one thing it can't be about two things and the same thing is true for a song um it's just a smaller thing and it has to be that and the thing has to be emotional and i believe that the thing has to um evolve and change over the course of it and that the goal of a song is to use the feelings that you're having this character is having to push you towards action, which then takes you back into scene. Because that's, without that, I think you end up in these moments that, um, I mean, that that leads you to ballads. And ballads are beautiful, um, but they're kind of deadly. Um, you can get away with a couple of them, but anytime you have a song that is just- Ballads are the slow songs. They're the ones where you like, maybe you cry, or maybe you're like checking your watch to see how far away intermission is. <laughs> yeah. And they're, and I mean, they're, they're beautiful sometimes, but they, they tend to not take you anywhere. And I, I, I kind of don't see the point of them. I think part of it is also that Brian and I, um, we cut our teeth on writing, uh, writing children's musicals. And I think that that, cha that changed the DNA of who we were as writers. And, uh, and I think, in a, I feel like it was in a really good way. It created a situation where we weren't allowed to have ballads. And we had to, if we were gonna have a battle, we had to earn it. And we had to create a situation where this was gonna, this really was 
the most important moment and the whole point of it. Maybe you can get over the ballot there, but the rest of the time, you always have to be thinking about where are you going? How does this get you there? And that leads you to um, things that are more like production numbers or a character thinking through an idea. And those kinds of things for me are so much more exciting to watch on stage. So um, define so what always- a production number is. I would love to define a production number. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so in there, let's just like say a couple kinds of songs you could have in the musicals that you're yes, going to write during this beautiful period of rest or creativity that we all have. So, <laughs> um, so as Kate said, there are ballads. Ballads are generally like solo numbers that are deeply introspective. Avoid that shit if you possibly can in your first draft. Someone will let you know if it's time to have a ballad. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if you're going to do something that uh, is uh, that is activating an ensemble, where you want to have like a sense of size and scope, like maybe in your opening number, um, thinking about what gift you're going to give your choreographer is the entire game. So in the same way that like when Lauren is crafting that point B of her story, where we're going, you'd better believe that that chick is thinking about where, about what that's going to look like. Like what the physical world of the piece is at the beginning and what the physical landing point is and how things have changed. We have to do the same thing for a choreographer. We have to give them a game to play. So one of Kate and my favorite examples is the opening of Annie where they're cleaning the orphanage. And the amount of joy. They end up with a clean orphanage. Done. In between, I'm there's done. an enormous amount of character development to get out. There's an enormous amount of stakes to realize, but like the director and choreographer aren't standing there after you give them the song being like, well, so while the orphans are standing there singing about how they're sad about being orphans, what, like, what am I watching? In this instance, they have this action to do. And if you look at like, and, and the, the thing is, is that um, there are plenty of songs, and that might be one of them actually, where uh, the writer did not think about how it was going to be staged. Um, but we have learned over time that having an idea of how something gets staged, having an idea, it's not to say it's the best way to stage it, it's not to say it's the only way to stage it, but having some sense of what's happening at all times on the stage changes things. We had, a, we had a song when we were writing, um, we, all the three of us worked on an Earth Re- a musical about space travel and Earth Re- this, this show called Earthrise. And we had this song that we wanted called Earthrise. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really liked the idea. I loved the idea of having a hook like that. And the entire, t- I mean, I think I spent like an entire week, Lauren, just like railing. <laughs> I was so, I was like, but what are they doing? what's happening and finally we landed on the idea of this being the song that allows them to travel from space back to the earth and once we figure that out we could write the song and we could get us we could use the song that was more thematic and more than this like emotional idea that then like tracks you getting back to earth and it's okay that you're talking about this big thematic idea because it's really grounded and really fucking fun i will say that is my son's favorite song in the whole show, Earthrise. So it's about, it, the Kennedy Center um, <clears throat> commissioned it last year. I mean, this is just last year, y'all. <laughs> it feels like a decade and a half ago, but, um, and it, it was about, ooh, yay, Brian can play some. Um, but yeah, it's about the Apollo 11 mission, the, the children of the astronauts and mathematicians and engineers that took them to the moon and back. So, but it was from the kids' eyes. This was for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, which was super cool. Y'all know I'm like scienced out. Yeah, you have to sing it. It was so good. But the reason why that's my son's favorite song is because while we're singing about, the reason why it's called Earth Rises is because that's the view when the earth rises in the way that from earth, the moon rises and we can see it and be like, oh, look at that, bo- a celestial body. But if you're on the moon, looking at the earth is like looking at the moon here. Anyway, it's supposed to be this like metaphysical, like wow of it. And the reason why my sons love it so much is because we are singing big feelings, like brain breaking feelings of how small, how beautiful our planet is, how it's all of us there. There's no borders from space. We're all just little creatures on the same rock. Oh my God, you know, all this great stuff. But we are watching Neil Armstrong and Mike Collins and Buzz Aldrin get back in that spaceship 
head home and pray to God that they make it and land safely in the Pacific Ocean. Um, and that is riveting. It is riveting. So we get the big ideas and the big heart swell of a, of a number, but also the activity of going, please be okay. They can do it. Did they did it? They landed. Woohoo! You know, it's so that's active. What, that's what musicals are good at. Like right there, that is, I think, why uh, that's the point of writing musical, because it allows you to take something that like is really kind of impossible to put on stage and it creates enough emotional through line that you believe that that happened. And and it has this sense of size and scope that is much bigger than what's literally happening in front of you. And it sort of gives you the extra feelings that you need to like push your imagination a little bit past where it can go naturally. Um, so that then you have this ability to like play and imagine with, with the audience um, and, and take it a, like just a bit further than you normally can go. And, and musicals are so good at that. And that's why, that's why you can do something epic with them, um, which is otherwise very hard to do on stage. It's like, it's the closest thing to cinema that we have on the stage yeah. are those big production numbers and musicals because yeah. the feel, the song, everything is big and, and it can yeah. travel. You can do a lot. I mean, we went from the moon to earth in that one number. That's yeah. a lot. You know, what's um, really, Ryan, oh. I've been watching a lot of, um, I've been watching a lot of uh, Disney movies recently because we're in quarantine with a four-year-old. And um, we were watching, I've watched, uh, I just watched Aladdin with my daughter and we were watching like, you know, never, uh, like Prince Ali, especially. Um, and it's so interesting because they, you take a song like that and it's, it, it's an extraordinary song. It's an extraordinary production number. And then like putting it on stage is such a challenge because they did exactly what you do really well in a musical, in, in a musical and a production number, except that they then like up it with animation, which also has this like ability to push so much farther than reality. And so then coming back to earth, um, in a theatrical setting and trying to do that on stage becomes so challenging. It's really fascinating. I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot. Brian, can you take us into a couple other songs? We did ballads, production numbers. What are a couple of the other core kinds of songs that sure. musicals offer us? I want to like... I want to talk about duets, but in a way that's really broad because you can have a big ensemble around. Um, I, one of my favorite examples that I use about as often as the orphanage one is um, Beauty and the Beast is Be Our Guest, where which you can kind of think of in some ways as a duet between the candlestick and the clock. Like anytime you can have two characters on stage who like believe really fiercely in the opposite outcome happening in a song, that is gold. Um, in our musical, Rosie Revere, Engineer, and Friends. <laughs> that is the title. There just aren't supposed to be quite so many ellipses. Um, we have a song called Field Trip, where um, all of the kids are just freaking screaming that they're on a field trip. They're so happy. We've got a teacher who is, uh, well, we have a, we have a um, chaperone essentially who is really off the rails, excited about pushing into the great unknown and the, and the potential of a field trip. And then we've got a teacher who is trying to stop it. And what you do is you create a situation where the lyricist has so many games to play in terms of like how these two people are fighting back and forth. I get to have these two people sing slightly differently and the choreographer and director get to have them constantly butting up against each other. So like the fact that that clock is running around in Be Our Guest trying to shut the operation down is enormously helpful. It is key to that whole endeavor is that you've got someone who wants to stop it. And that can be true when there's only two people on stage too. Um, anytime you can get two people to have an idea that is deep within the fabric of your piece that two people feel really differently about, you're, you're golden. Yeah, there's something that I think is lost a lot of times when people are talking about songs, which is that um, just like in plays, songs are best in musicals, they are best when they have conflict, when they're built out of conflict, whether it's internal conflict and you're like, oh my God, am I gonna, am I, am I going to do this? Am I not gonna do this? I have to figure it out. And by the end, I know whether or not I'm gonna do it. Or it's external conflict between more than one character, which is gold. But like 
there has to be some kind of tension. And without it, you end up with you end up with songs that don't move the story forward and they are therefore cuttable. It doesn't matter how beautiful it is, someone has to make there be conflict that justifies us going into the song and hanging out. Yeah. And change, right? Conflict is change. We have yeah. to, the song has to have change to the world, the character, the motivation, the situation. By and you can it. go of that. And when like, you get to a point where you're allowed to write your ballad because someone has told you that it's time now, <laughs> you will be so good at conflict in your songs that you'll be set. Um, all of the songs that like have always mattered the most to me in terms of ballads are like have deep conflict. I dim the lights to think about you, spend sleepless nights to think about you. You said you loved me or you were, were you just being kind or was I losing my mind? There's so much conflict in, in that song. There's so much conflict in, I won't send roses to show I care. I won't send roses or flatter your hair or whatever. Um, I won't send roses and roses suit you. So like anytime you can get to this place where it's like, oh, I want this thing and I can't have it. Conflict, conflict, conflict. Um, another song type that is very useful to you in telling your big Lauren Gunderson stories that go from here to there are sequences, um, which if you picture like, you know, those like cheesy, like um, like action movie sequences or like where like someone emerges like with the, their hair done at the end. Like our version of that on stage is we just like, you do an awesome song and you just start moving through plot at light speed. And Lauren gives you 20 pages of, of plot and dialogue and things and we eat them. And it comes out as four minutes <laughs> of musical theater number. And I, I think it's interesting because I, I, I think that something that is really important too is that there a lot of the things that we're talking about that that um, the conflict between the clock and Lumiere and also this kind of song a sequence is actually a production number like the truth is <laughs> is that if you can be in a production number you should be in a production number like it's always better to be in a production number than to be in something that's more static um, it's much better to know what the, that there's movement, that you're going somewhere in a song than to know that these two people are going to stand there and sing at each other. Um, that's a, that's a hard, that's always harder to stage. It's always more likely to cause problems once you actually get into production. It's better yeah. to have gamblers gambling on stage and rolling the dice and having that raise the stakes. It's better to have the monkeys singing at the end of act one of Wicked. I look out, I, she's, she's flying. It's better to know well how they feel about it and them singing, get her, they're the clock. You wanna have the clock. <laughs> you gotta have a clock. I mean, I will just say practically for um, the advice in terms of how we actually collaborate and work together, we're always having these conversations and there is no judgment if somebody's like, I think there's no conflict in this. And I'm like, oh my God, you're totally right. Fabulous, let's get a clock. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and even in terms of tone, like sometimes I or Kate can tell Brian, it just feels too, too sexy, too happy, too sad. We, we need something that's more this or more that. And Brian being the genius that she is can just be like, give me two minutes, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it all changes into like a brilliant, <laughs> a brilliant new world, a whole new world, if you, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, so similarly, and sometimes there's a lyric question where I, one of us can be like, this lyric makes me think of something weird. Can we, is there another word? And Kate will similarly in two minutes come back with a whole new lyric. So we kind of, we like to work fast. We like to talk all the time. There's no wrong thing to say. There's no offense taken. If somebody's like, nah, nah, this is not gonna work. Um, we're always making each other, at least from my perspective, I feel like I'm being made a better writer, a more thoughtful writer. Um, and every single thing, it's like a play, every single thing in the show has to have a reason to be there. We know, we need to know, all of us know what it's doing. Can it be done better, <laughs> um, et cetera, et cetera. And the other answer to collaboration is Google Docs, <laughs> where all three of us can be in the same document online, watching each other type and move and note. Um, so that is, that is the great <laughs> equalizer of collaboration these days is, is Google Docs. Um, Lauren, what do you think that there are things that you can't do in musicals that you can do in plays and vice versa at this point in your um, headspace? That's such a good question. I don't know. I mean, I think there are, um, 
there are kind of simulacra of both. I mean, you can kind of do a thing that you can kind of do. It's a different thing in musicals, but they accomplish the same thing. Like just a great juicy monologue is the same thing about ballads where it's like monologues really easy to write, very hard to justify. <laughs> you think it's your greatest writing and then, you know, five minutes into the monologue, the audience is ruffling their programs and being like, get me out of here. Um, similar, can, can be very similar with the ballad. I kind of equate those two. Um, I think you can do uh, musicals because you mentioned these production numbers and these sequences, montaginess kind of, uh, that, that would be the cinematic term. I think it allows you to go farther quicker. Um, you have to, it, it doesn't feel unnatural to have, you know, 20 years pass in one song in a musical, but it feels a little odd in a play to do that even in one scene, even in one, even in one play, it feels like a lot. So I think there's more movement. <clears throat> and I, I often say I'm so jealous of music because it can drop you into an emotional space in seconds. And a play has to do a lot of work to get you to the place of going, oh God, my heart is just, oh, wow, I feel so bad for him. You know, but a musical can be like, bum, bum, oh God, I feel so bad for him, <laughs> like instantly. So you can, I think do, that's part of why we think of musicals, I think of as being so emotional is because you can do so many emotions so quickly, back to back, do them all. <laughs> I, I think Brian, one of the things that you said um, not terribly long ago that like really, really hit me was the idea that Musical, musicals aren't great at nuance. And mm. I think that's really true. Like when I think when you first said it, like I wanted to, I wanted to fight it. I don't um, want that true. I don't want it to be true, but I actually think it is very true. Um, and it, it's, it's definitely what I use plays for. Mm. I use plays to talk about really, really nuanced ideas and things that like, I definitely can't write a song about in, like it won't be as effective if I write a song about it. Um, because it's a weird idea that's like, like literally if it's an idea that I've never heard someone say before, that's when I want to write a play about it. And I want to spend the entire time getting to the place where I can make people feel the thing that I definitely like know as a feeling that I've never heard said out loud. And like with a musical, I don't want to do that. I think I'm looking for more universal truths and like big ideas that everybody feels, but putting the circumstances giving them circumstances that might be very far away from um, a, an audience member's circumstances so that they then feel that connection to, um, to a character that they wouldn't necessarily realize that they're similar to. Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's stunning the extent to which musicals can traffic in melodrama without you realizing it's even melodrama. Um, and it's, and, and how like, uh, like the titans of, theater over the past century have created like a lot of their best work arguably are these really nuanced pieces like Carolina Change like Passion like and, and they they really struggle to fill like large theaters and to really go on a communal journey um, I think that's well said that's yeah so but let's back maybe up one about of you will write a deeply nuanced blockbuster musical <laughs> we'll see sure <laughs> I don't know, I think Fun Home was probably the closest I've seen to yeah. doing something very specific mm -hmm. and um, unexpected. Um, the way the music is written, the, I mean, all of it kind of felt like, oh, I don't, I know what, this is amazing. I've yeah. never been here before. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's a character that I, but but on some level, it was also that what it, the, the thing that I think it's most, it's, I think it's successful on so many levels, but I, the, one of the things that I think it's, it's most successful at is, is actually that sense of having the moment where you're like, oh, I've never been asked to identify with this character before, but I'm completely capable of identifying with this character. Yes. And I think that, that actually is, that's something musicals are, is really, really good at. Yeah. Um, and so that's where I think it, it that's, that feels like the reason it, it worked to me. And yeah, I think it's like universal, even though it's not. This, like we are talking to some extent about artistic versus financial success. And right. you can say like that, that Stephen Sondheim's passion is an artistic success. You can't say it's a financial success. And when you put Dear Evan Hansen and Fun Home side by side, you can say that Fun Home is an artistic triumph, but you can't say it's a financial success in terms of like longevity and, and in terms of the sheer number of people that will see that. And so there is something kind of confusing sometimes in musical theater about like 
what our biggest tent, like, like millions and millions of billions of people will see this property, like whether or not you can take something that is as phenomenal as what Fun Home is and have that translate to really large audiences. I don't know. It's so because I feel like that's also true. Like, I mean, we could, we could say the same thing about fiction about literature like there's like there's the James Patterson books that I mean so many more people read James Patterson books than read like Rebecca Mackay's book uh The Great Believers and I think Rebecca Mackay's book The Great Believers is one of the most extraordinary books I've read in the last five years and it, it, it I don't know that it can be about that um and, and I think it's on oh I guess I, I, here's what I think it is it can be about that I think it's unfair to say that it has to be about that because there's so many other, I mean, like there's also people don't no, not that many people read poetry. It doesn't mean that, that they're like the greatest poets that are writing right now aren't doing extraordinary work that's important. You know, I feel like equating the, if as financial, I know that our, we're, we're an artistic medium, but we're in this very commercial setting, but that's, that's true of fiction too. Mm -hmm. Let's back up for a second um, <clears throat> to kind of go like, if you were talking to people just starting a musical theater career or just starting like, can I write musicals? Should I write musicals? How do you do it? Um, how do you <clears throat> start? How do you, do you, the, the normal questions, do you outline? Do you talk about character first? Do you just start writing a song and have that be the seed? How have the different projects that you've started come about, kind of when do you know, oh, I can definitely write this? All of those kind of beginning questions, which even for those of us who've written lots of plays or musicals, they, I still feel like a beginner at the beginning of every idea. <laughs> like, what do I do again? <laughs> two really good ways to start. And one of them feels like starting with an idea and the other feels like starting with a partner. Um, and like both of those feel like really fertile ways to launch something either by thinking about a book that you want to adapt or like a story, something that happened to you that you feel like there's an emotional undercurrent to that feels deeply musical or a human who you just feel like the two of you might be able to make something together. Certainly that was how Kate and I started is like, we had no idea what we were going to make together only that it seemed like the two of us should make something together. Yeah, I think now at this phase in my life, I think I I like to start from I like to start from an idea, um, and I really like to start from some kind of outline. Um, it can be really rough, um, but and 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 before the outline, actually, um, a conversation like the ones that we have, um, where you're just hanging out and talking about an idea and seeing how you can have like if you're with smart people that you believe in, who you think are great writers, um, and that doesn't mean they have to be fancy writers. Um, they just have to, like, they have to get you and you have to get them. And if you're in those kinds of conversations, I think if you posit an idea and then somebody else can lob back another idea and you can start to build off what feels concrete and what everybody gets excited about. Then like from there, you can end up with an outline or you can end up with a really rough draft. Lauren tends to write from like a really rough draft for us. And that's really fun because Lauren always knows where she's going. She like kind of won't um, commit until she knows what the end is. And then once she knows what the end is, she kind of writes this like really, really rough, almost not draft, but that has a beginning and has an ending. And like the middle is a big old, question mark and it's so useful <laughs> because if you know where you're starting and you know where you're landing you have your it doesn't matter if you don't know the rest you can start to you can start to build it in you can start to dream about what you can do you can start to say oh I think there has to be a song about this thematic idea and then she says great I'll write a scene about that um but like that I think that ability to like sort of put pen to paper sort of have like a little something that feels concrete enough that then you start getting ideas for songs, then I think you can start just writing songs. You can start moving forward. Yeah, that sounds right to me. I mean, I think so much of what, why an outline is honestly even more important for musicals is because we're looking for balance too. And I'd love for y'all to talk about stuff that you, you both taught me of going, wow, we've had a lot of solos. We've had a lot of duets. Gosh, we'd have nothing but production number after production number. How do we balance that? How do you have 
intro number. It's big. We get the world. We are singing about a lot of people are singing. And then we have a duet. And then we have a solo because now we really know who our main character is. And now we have a trio and then another production number. And then the act. What's the act break number? Which for those of you who've been watching the other classes, that midpoint, something's got to change. It's our defying gravity. It's our she's flying. <laughs> it's, you know. I feel like this is a, a, a world in which a conversation in which like musicals, the construction of musicals and plays um, feels the most different because like the building block of a play are these scenes that need to make linear sense and that like in a lot of instances exist in naturalism and where you need the, everything to be believable and you're constantly just trying to like in some ways coax yourself along in a way that like doesn't break the tendrils of story you're stretching. In a musical you're sort of trying to move at such a, a hyper speed, even in something like Fun Home, like the sheer distance you you travel is enormous. You move at a really fast velocity through emotional territory. Um, and so for me, I feel like having a bird's eye view of the, of the score um, can also give you a bird's eye view of the story. At all points, I try and kind of have, if there's like 15 songs in a 90 minute musical or 18 in a two hour musical, I kind of have placeholder titles for all of them as I'm going. And I kind of fill in songs even though they don't exist yet. Like I know there's gonna be a moment of catharsis for my main character. I don't know where that's gonna go. I have hunches that it's probably gonna go somewhere in the middle of the second act. I was about I to say, know. act two. <laughs> I have a hunch that that's probably going to happen there. I don't know exactly when in the first 15 minutes I'm going to have a moment where I get deeply on board with my protagonist or what that will look like. But I know that moment's going to happen somewhere in there. And so I want to make room for it. I just want to like kind of leave myself space that I can fill in later. Um, and I try and not worry too much about the connective tissue. Um, and try and like kind of just like leave myself um, like these little landmarks that I can then figure out how to get to. And so if we go, okay, here's our character list. We've got these two characters who are deeply ideologically opposed in our musical about televisions. And so I'm going to probably write a song about televisions at some point that has the two of them in it. Where's the most exciting place in this story for me to take these two characters and have them fight it out about that, you know? And so then I, and then it's, whether it's you or your writing partner, like someone else then puts that hat on and goes, how do I get this, how do I make this scene get me from two people who don't know each other suddenly fighting about televisions? I don't know, but what a great prompt. Yeah, I, I one of the- <laughs> All of a sudden I was like, oh, I am an absolute lunatic. No, one of the things that I, um, when I've taught, book writing classes, because this is a very songwritery way to think about a, about a story and it's incredibly useful. And without it, I think that you're in danger. If you're a book writer, you're in danger of not having a musical, but having a play. Um, and so one of the things that I've always forced my um, libretto writing courses to spend some time doing is I'll, I'll like print out um, a bunch of, um, song lists and I'll take musicals that they know and like maybe I'll, I'll have made them read the musical already but that I make them look at just the song titles in like ragtime or once on this island Aaron's is already very good at this um but there's but there's plenty of other examples Rodgers and Hammerstein any anyone who is a, a great dramatist as a songwriter Stephen Schwartz um they all have that you can look at the song list and you can see the play. You can yeah, see right. what it is. And it's so valuable because it reminds you that that's the goal. <laughs> if the goal is that you're going to, because eventually you're going to sit down with a playbill when you're sitting there in front of the theater and you're going to look down and there's a song list in your program. And that song list better look exciting. And that song list better look a little bit like the show that you're trying that, that you've made. Um, and so those hooks matter so much on so many levels. Are often the song title or the yes. hook is just like the most repeated phrase. Defying gravity is a hook and it's something you hear a bunch of times. And 
ideally you've got some song titles, some song hooks that you're going to hear a lot that are major anchor points for multiple characters that are convergence points or divergence points that these are the fabric that in some ways, like you could almost, if you have a Lauren Gunderson play and then you have the adaptation of that play side by side, if you were to then look at the song list of that, that adaptation, it would be a clocking of big thematic ideas, major character moments. And like, yeah, it'd be yeah. such a weird exercise to just like write the song hooks for August Osage County. You could do it. <laughs> but you like, totally do it. Like, and it should be a summary basically yeah. of major yeah. emotional landmark points. If you have song titles that are deeply, deeply unconnected to your characters or your plot or major turns of character. You have a problem. You have a problem. Yeah. Well, and it's it's part of why the book writer's job is to get to the song because the song does the work. This is why there's not a list of the scenes. There's a list of the songs right. because the songs are the heart, the soul, the head, the change, the force, the gravity, the, all of it is, is in. But one of the best things that a book writer can give to the songwriters is a problem that has right. to be solved. Song. So it's like, get to the song, tell me what the problem is that this song has to solve and then I'm ready, like I'm so ready to write it. I'm like, great, yeah. okay, done. Well, and we talk about ramping, building the ramp to the song and the, the entrance ramp and the exit ramp and the idea that a ramp, I mean, even architecturally, it's getting hard. <laughs> Things are rising, stakes are rising. The, the song bursts out of a moment of emotional need and emotional eruption so that it's not just, you know, my job isn't like characters enter, another character enters, the song. <laughs> like, no, someone comes in going, how could you do that? What are you, are you crazy? We're gonna lose everything if you did it, da, 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 da. And now we're singing about the thing and we're singing. <laughs> Brian mm -hmm. would write something much better than that. <laughs> you have to, the, I don't mean this as a direct response to that. Um, you have to be brave to be bad. Like, and this feels like essential to who I am as a human. Um, you, you have to be brave enough to put out the bad idea. If you're gonna like collaborate, and I do believe that musicals are kind of like an, the epitome of what collaborative multi-genre work can be, you have to be brave enough to put out the bad title of a song so that, you're, so that the lyricist can respond to it and possibly move towards a, 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 a better title. You have to be brave enough to get a little egg on your face and like musicals for better and worse traffic an enormous amount of, amount of vulnerability, both in the performance of musicals and the creation of them. And so I also think that like creating safe spaces connected to how you collaborate, like talking about how you're going to work is part of it talking about like how you'll respond to each other's ideas and how you'll like make sure you feel good as you do something so vulnerable when you're just writing a I mean Lauren is that something like how does the vulnerability differ for you when you're writing a play versus when you're like doing something in a writer room or in a collaborative writing process um it's hard it's harder to know uh because I am second guessing myself, which I've gotten very good at, but, but it is better. And I will say the, the literal practical advice in what Brian is saying is that I will quite literally say to Kate, okay, so the bad song is, I need you so much, I love you as much as I love ice cream. <laughs> terrible, terrible, very terrible. And then Kate goes, oh, I see, yes, yes, yes. Okay, and she makes it brilliant, poetic, great. Brian can go, the bad scene, the bad conflict is the mom comes in and says, ever since you were born, I've known you, da, da, da. And I'm like, oh, I get it. Gotcha, gotcha. Now let me do the subtle, fun, character-y, funny version of that. You know, and we we all kind of can see, yeah. we, I think we quite literally say, here's the bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I think that the the it's a it's an interesting combination of like bravery and also confidence. Um, and it can't, but it can't be ego. Cause like you have to be just as willing to drop the idea as you are to keep going on the idea. And you have to believe that you have to, you have to believe that the people in the room are as smart as you are and are at every idea that they have is as valid as your ideas. But you also can't doubt your own ideas because you have to believe that it's okay that you have an idea and that your idea is gonna be half baked and you're gonna give it out half baked and that that's the goal. Um, and that sense of 
safety and making sure that the people around you know that they're valued, know that they're, that, that you think that they're great and continuing to like say that not as like a pat on the back, but just like as a, just remember that I think you're awesome. And that's why we're in this room. So even if I say something about something you, you, the idea you had, if I, even if I say no to that idea, it's not because I don't think you have great ideas. Like the reason you're here, the reason I'm here, the reason we're doing this is because we all believe in each other. And I think that's such a fundamental part of it. Um, that like, I remember I, like in, in middle school and high school, we knew like a bunch of really, really talented people. And at the time, I don't think I'd like, I kind of took it for granted, but I also kind of took it for granted that like none of us were really that talented. Like, I just thought we were all talented for our group. And then like, I got to New York and about, you know, like there were like six people who are incredibly talented. And guess what? I think all six of those people are still incredibly talented. Like it didn't change. And so I think that sense of your own um, taste matters a ton and should be honored. And I think it, it doesn't mean that like the people you don't like their writing or you don't like the way that they sing is they're not good. It means it's not your taste. And so when you do find those people, you have to hold on to them and you have to tell them that they're great and you have to work with them as much as you can. I want to spotlight that to the idea of like collaboration is also like negotiating group taste. It's, 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 and every time you add a member to your collaboration, you have to renegotiate that. And so like my taste is not the same as Kate Kerrigan's taste. It's not the same as Lauren Gunderson's taste. Kate and I have things that fall within the Venn diagram of things that are our shared tape and then taste and then the three of us do as well. And so there's also an element to collaboration that is talking about the books and the movies and the musicals and the music and talking about what you like and what feels good to you and what is like adjacent to the pieces that you're working on together. Um, there is an element of collaboration that is just becoming good friends with people yeah. um, and kind of being kind to yourselves and remembering, especially in musicals, that you don't speak the same languages. Like the language in which I create is like nominally textual like mostly the things I create are are atmospheric and tonal and so Lauren and I we have to have a pigeon language we have to create ways of talking to each other and we have Kate who acts as an intermediary sometimes and sometimes we don't have Kate to act as an intermediary and no. so you find as you make up words to describe things that you're doing as you like send people things that like ultimately end up just being really silly things that you've sent them. Um, and you have to be okay to just like talk about the television that you're binge watching and why you think it might be relevant to your second act problem. You know, I will say that is, there's a lot of ways to make a thing. And one example I will use again as practical advice for y'all out there is <clears throat> if Kate and Brian are trying to write a song, we're trying to figure out what is the song? What should it be? We know it needs to be uh, one a solo, this is our chance to get to know this character, care about what they care about. Okay, the, the practical homework is Lauren, go home and write a monologue that will never be in this play, but tells the, all of the secrets of the singer. And what, what are they worried about? What do they love? What do they hate? What's going on? And just blah, 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 blah. And then maybe there is two words in that, that Kate goes, oh, that's an intro. Maybe that's part of some of a hook. And then they'll start collaborating. And then maybe ask me for, could you write a little bit more about this? Or, or like, no, 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 okay. They will take all of that away and write a whole new song that is, you know, and all of that is a form of, of collaboration because there's things I know about this musical that they don't. There's things Brian knows for sure about this musical that we don't. And we're kind of constantly finding ways to to share enough to keep it going. And again, it may be the bad version, but even in plays, a version is the version that'll get you to the good version, that'll get you to yeah. the great version, that'll get you to the version that's like, yes, opening night, we did it. Brian and I worked on a song recently um, for a new project that we're doing with a, with a book writer. And um, I had like some very strong feelings about some of the hook ideas for it. And uh, I had very strong, I had some like really solid, like, I was like, I know that the song is called um, this is the after the band song, Brian. Um, there was, I know that the song is called after the band. I know what these two characters are talking about. I know that it's a duet between these two people. I know why it's called after the band. Here's some lyrics for it. And the 
book writer was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. And then Brian said it to music and was like this. And we were like, no, that doesn't work. And then Brian said it to music again. And we were like, no, that doesn't work. I just like kept trying different music on it. <laughs> and then finally, Brian, and what was really cool is that at each step, we ended up having these really interesting conversations about like the tonal landscape and the reason Brian needed something. Because Brian was clocking different things than we were. We were clocking character and story and Brian was clocking the tonal place that we were in the act and that we had to, we couldn't have the kind of song that I wanted initially and the book writer initially wanted. But we also knew that the song was probably about this. And I knew enough to there send you, bad music. Where I knew we, enough to say, this is definitely wrong. And yet, here you go. And then we finally hit this amazing moment where um, Brian like hybrid it enough and zhuzhed it enough and like forced it into this other form. And then I rewrote all of the lyrics to the song, except for the hook, except like there was a couple little things that we like, we were like, okay, these parts work. But I rewrote the entire thing. And the song is like a hundred times better for having gone through that crazy process. Um, and that, but that kind of goes to, I mean, the question you must get asked all the time, like what comes first, lyrics or music? And it's having worked with y'all, it is both, both and yeah. yes, no, all of it, none of it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I like it's it's just too hard to answer at this point. Um we I I think I have a like addiction to learning new tools and learning new methodologies of working and learning new ideas like and so I take pride in the fact that Kate and I have never written a song like the same way twice. Like <laughs> but on the other side, I do think that there is like there is a genesis for every song like we, we do the same thing that we do for writing a show, which is that we like sit around talking about the song for a little while. Unless one of us is like, I got this, let me write a whole draft or something. Like, let me write some section of it. And that happens occasionally where one of us like has a very strong instinct. But for the most part, we end up like talking for a little bit, thinking about hooks, thinking about that thematic idea. And then once we hit that, then we then we try all kinds of different In the things. same way we're talking about how you wouldn't write a musical linearly, just like line by line from the beginning, you kind of need to structure out where you're going and you need to give yourself those landmarks. Um, same thing yeah. within a song. Like you're not gonna just start writing the song at the beginning and make your way through unless you're, you know, just, I, I don't even have an example of stream of conscious. Well, no, it's unless you're R. Kelly, but don't be R. Kelly. <laughs> No, but, but I think the thing about, especially musical theater songs is that they are never, they're not linear. They're still recursive, they, but they have, they have a job to do in that recursive environment. So if you don't know what that last thing that you're doing is, you're totally fucked. <laughs> you can't get the job done. A standard way of this happening would be, Lauren, can you spitball a four sentence monologue about literally anything? Sure. I, this character just really hates um, the, uh, uh, the arguments that her neighbor is having and she feels like she needs to go save this woman because the guy is so verbally mean to her but she's terrified of going over there because of her past and her bad relationships and even though she knows that, that this woman's gotta get out, she's terrified to, to go over there and do it. Kate, can you brainstorm a couple hooks that are possible? For like what it could be called. Is she singing? Is she singing this song before she goes over? Is she singing this song as she goes over? She's in conflict about whether or not she's going to go yeah, over. Going to go over. Um, um, seen it all before. Um, I'm not doing that again. Um, None of my business. Oh, I like none of my business. That That's resonated with me. Mm -hmm. But it's none of my business. If I walk over there, Kate, you'll fix that lyric. You'll make it better. No, it's none of my business. I'm not going anywhere. Or maybe I am. You know, and it's and we're going back. <laughs> enforce thing conflict but you know i would just pass that and then we'd talk about what wasn't good about it and then we'd keep iterating <laughs> but in order to be able to do that I, like, I, 
bravery is the word. I think that the thing that we yeah. all just demonstrated is bravery. Um, to be to be brave to like to put your first ideas out there. You can move so efficiently through collaboration when you can create um, where you can create a room or a digital room where you feel safe, where you can trust, and where you can just kind of both brainstorm and then also narrow in on ideas that like clock to multiple people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the other thing that we do sometimes, like we do the inverse of what we just did, which is that like I'll go and take, well, we've, we've had this like weird new process where we'll have like a bunch of hooks for a show and then I will write lyrics for all of the hooks. Literally, um, it'll just make up a hundred possible song titles. And, and then just, I, like, just like the weirdest little musical shopper going down the aisles, I'll be like, oh, I'll take this one, please. Yeah, and it's and it's one of those things where like, especially because you know none of them, like your ex expectation becomes that like, maybe like 10 of these 25 things will lead to anything. It, it, it becomes really easy to go really fast, which actually I think is that, I think that is the thing that the three of us, like as our like trifecta, we are really not precious and we are really fast. I and that being so useful. There's yeah. something emotional I want to say about that. And like, maybe one of you can, I, I'm going to speak a little in metaphor because I don't know how to say it, but maybe this is another way that our collaboration works. Um, so thinking about the idea of like giving space and holding space and taking up space within a collaboration is something I've thought about a lot. Um, like A, in terms of how I choose my collaborators, I'm, I specifically am generally not coming from having an idea for a piece, but rather just being drawn to humans where I wanna amplify their voice and where I feel like I want to add emotional resonance to the kinds of stories they tell. And I wanna like propel outward the kinds of stories they tell. And something that like the idea of cutting your work and trimming your work and making room in your work, something that I've learned as a writer is that when I can create space in the, in like the number of minutes we have, like that when I can create space, I'm giving room to my collaborators. So like when we're talking about Lauren not having the space for a five minute monologue in the piece, that's because she is ceding some territory to what Kate is able to do and saying, this is something that like, as much as we all know that Lauren Gunderson can write a freaking monologue, right? <laughs> we know that. It's a choice that Lauren's making to say, hey, I give you this space to use. And for me, like me taking up space is important as a writer. It's important for me to say, no, we're, we're gonna make this character sing. And it's also important to know when it's, when it's time to give your other collaborators stage time and every time you're making the choice to cut that song to cut that lyric to cut that scene you worked that's an act of giving space to other people to your collaborators I like that and it's and it's also an, an honorific of saying or an honoring of saying this is what you do so well so you instrumentalize the F out of that emotion so that our actor can just bend and close their eyes and feel the feels while that music is swelling before they boom with Kate's amazing hook that we finally get to go like, oh, she is defying gravity <laughs> or whatever. Um, but also for those out there, there are songs that bottom, bottom out and there's a little scene in the middle of it. And that's mm -hmm. a, a way for Brian and Kate to go, Lauren, this is what you're gonna help us do better than we can do is to clarify this plot point or give that piece of information so that the singer goes, oh, what? And now I'm gonna sing the rest of the song with that new information, right? So we are constantly, you know, passing the ball and the baton in terms of who can take us to the right place, the right way so that we all get to make something beautiful. Y'all, it is so hard and it is so worth it. I can't believe it that like at this point in my life and we're like, I still just freaking love musicals. I know. I know. Much, but like, that's not true actually. I think that like musicals in some ways like not as capable at, of getting to some of the ideas I want them to get to. They're not as, but like the thing I love 
the thing that like is like a shot of dopamine that I can't get anywhere else is that feeling of creative mind melding with other writers that does span genres. It's thrilling and the experience of having like Kate write a lyric to music that like was always there, even though it hadn't been there until a few seconds ago. The feeling of like having taken Lauren's scene and totally like ripped it away from her, claimed it as our own and remounted it and have Lauren like nod and go, okay. And feel like we honored her and that like we didn't destroy her play, but like God to even acknowledge that maybe you even like added to it, it, the the experience of getting to be that deep within someone else's creative project um, process is, um, it is, <laughs> it is beyond words. It's the greatest. I will say, so now we're kind of at the end of our hour. So I would love for both of y'all to say one more thing. I will start by saying that for most of my career, I was writing plays and I was writing plays and often kind of being confronted with various people in the theater community that seemed to be uncomfortable or didn't quite understand why I was writing such big emotion, why I was writing big feeling and characters that didn't exit to have their cry, but were like center stage to have their cry or their rage or their revelation. Um, I was like, no, I put center stage. That's why I come to the theater. So of course, Fast forward a few years, it is no surprise that I am now writing almost half of my projects are musicals in different in different forms or musicals that I can't wait to write. I'm always texting Kate and I had a new idea for a musical, <laughs> texting Brian being like, cool, wait, here's another random thing that may be a thing. Um, and it's because of that bigness. I think musicals let us do big emotional work and the way music can sink everyone in an audience within seconds emotionally is an extraordinary power. It is primally human. It is collective and congregational. It is like the church, the biggest church <laughs> for me um, and is musicals. And so much of what I learned was because of these two people and so much of what I love to, why I love to do it is because of them. So I'm so excited y'all got to hear from them. What are the last couple of things uh, you both want to say to- I'm not going to really say anything because like for some reason I'm like just on the verge of tears at just being so grateful for like my ongoing like friendships and collaborations with both of you. It really, it I pinch myself every time I get to like collaborate with your words um i'll plug our socials yes please say that um kate and i are really easy to find and we're also like always doing things um uh, both like sharing like skills on the internet and also like doing collaborative writing projects and things online so if you want more to find the mad ones and all of the I'm ways that they can listen to you called the mad ones that um we won't issue shutdown notices if you start performing it in your bedrooms uh it's uh so you can listen to the mad ones on spotify um and they can even <laughs> email kate and she'll just send you the script um <laughs> but uh so we're kerrigan loudermilk on instagram or kerrigan loudermilk on facebook i'm um and you can find kate kerrigan and brian loudermilk really easily so just like come getting up in our business um, and please make musicals that look like you and that like talk like you and that are nuanced, bizarre, weird musicals that are filled with bad ideas that are actually really good ideas and that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, I was just gonna say that we should, um, I, I think it's worth in this weird time, it's not, it doesn't have to be about like product. It doesn't have to be about getting somewhere and finishing something. But I do think that this is a, this is a very strange moment in all of our lives, like universally. <laughs> and if you have people that you can grab who you love, who are talent, who you believe that you're talented and they believe that you're talented, um, I think it's a really, really good time to grab those people and start to just share ideas and talk about hopes and dreams and things that you might be able to make together. Um, because this is, it's a good little incubation period where there's not a lot of, it's there aren't a lot of stakes. Um, if you get nothing done during this period, that's okay. And that actually is one of the best times to start something because you could just start to dream a little bit and then see what sticks. Um, and but but I think finding those people and and reaching out to those people, which is another kind of bravery, um, telling someone that you think that they're incredibly talented and that you want to work with them, um, it's. It, it might surprise you what their response would be. 
And so I think that that's a really valuable kind of just first step. Oh yeah. Thank y'all for being who you are, for being creative and for joining and sharing your wisdom with all these us. amazing people out there. Hi, amazing people. Thanks for watching. Thanks for giving us something. Even though we can't make theater as easily as we can, we can sure as hell talk about it all day, <laughs> <laughs> which is my favorite thing to do. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, I will try to go on to the Facebook comments and answer any specific questions. Kate and Brian may be convinced to do the same. Yeah. Um, thanks for watching. We have a bunch of other interviews like this coming up, directors, dramaturgs. We uh, just heard that we have two um, trans writers and actors. We're going to talk about writing trans characters and casting trans actors. 